Yeah, Dr. Dre is in full effect, and I gotta tell y'all a little something. Easy E is down with us. MC Ring, you know he's down with us. DJ Yella is down with us. Arabian Prince, you know he's down with us. Tony A the Wizard is down with us. JJ Fag is down with us. Timmy T, you know he's down with us. DJ Poo Boy is down with us. Toddy B and Spade, they're down with us. My boy Ice Cube, you know he's down with us. I like to mention, so pay attention to where I'm from. Compton, but the tapes are from the rodeo. My name is Dre, listen while I play. And by the way, I'm also down with NWA. Yo, Steve at the rodeo is down with us. Slang and funky tapes, it is a must. We're number one. Yo, welcome back to Rodeo Radio, episode 14. Uh, I got a special guest today, but before we jump into his interview, uh, let me just say that uh, I'm going to have fun with this one because uh, I've been knowing my brother for years since we've been teenagers. So uh, sometimes since I know his story, uh, uh, it's kind of hard to interview because I know the guy. I love the guy. We've been friends for a long time. Uh, there's been times where we haven't seen each other for a minute, but as soon as uh, we catch up, we pick a ride where we left off. So uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome my brother, Sir Jinx. Thank Yo, you for coming, up, my brother. Hey, uh, thanks um, for having me, man. Well, let me say this. Uh, you are a must to be on this radio show, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, not only did you know Steve Yano, he introduced us. But you also have radio, rhodium roots, what I like to call, uh, because before I started doing the mixtapes, you were actually rapping on them. Right. You know, so other than that, man, how you been? Everything good? Man, I've been good, man. Just, uh, you know, enjoying the fruits of my labor, you know, just loving hip hop and, uh, you know, just seeing how, how, how it's going to progress, you know, how, how we going to make out and, you know, my name going to be around for years, you know. I'm just, uh, just loving it, man. I, I couldn't wish for nothing better. No, no. You know what? Uh, uh, we're going to do the interview a little bit different. Usually, I like to start where people start, you know, with school and stuff like that. Right. But I want to jump right into when we first met. Right. And um, it was 1987 at the Rhodium Swamp Meet. And uh, if uh, all depending on what part of the year, I could have been 18, 19 years old, but I know uh, I'm like two years older than you, if right. I'm correct. And uh, if I could refresh your memory, uh, I hadn't seen Steve for about six years. Mm -hmm. Steve Yano, uh, the guy who we uh, based this documentary on. And I went to go visit him. I didn't think he would recognize me because I hadn't seen him in a while. Right, right. And uh, I remember when I walk up, I see him. He, he says, hey, Tony, he remembers me. But right behind him, I saw Dr. Dre. Right. And I was like, holy shit. Because to me, that's Dr. Dre from the World Class Wrecking Crew. Right, right. Right next to him was you. I didn't know who you were just yet. Right. And Eric was sitting on um, on um, a record crate. Right. So Steve asked me, you know, so um, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm DJing. And then he goes, let me see you go off. He had two turntables back there at the, the swamp meet. So I started cutting and scratching. To make a long story short, I remember Dre tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and he said, I did a, I did a good job. And I was like, okay, cool. And I remember he grabbed a, a um, piece of paper and a pen and he writes down your number mm -hmm. and he said I want to hook you with my cousin he's producing a record and I want you to do you know hook up with them maybe do some scratching on it or something right and then uh, I met Eric I didn't know he was easy right right and the thing that stood out about him was I remember I was looking at his Air Force Ones or like his white Nike shoes you know mm -hmm. and I remember I told Steve Yano hey man that guy still has his price tag still mm -hmm. on his shoe you don't want to tell him and steve tells me no no that's just the way he wears it like okay that was the first time i've ever seen that i think those are adidas he probably wear adidas of a whole 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 lot so adidas and felix okay i remember he used to buy a whole bunch of shoes remember i said um dre and eric were the first people i seen go to um foot locker and buy all their sizes you know what i'm saying like wow. Like they have a whole crate. I mean, a whole you know the little dolly thing. It's Twelve pair of shoes or whatever, and whatever size, whatever uh, shoe Eric liked at the time, he'll buy all of them in his size. All of them. All right. I never seen nobody buy two pair of shoes. Just in case, <laughs> let alone just in 15. case he got a little scuff. Oh, uh, he 
he was fresh to death. It was the Feelers, the Cortezes, or the Adidas. Or them uh, Michael, them Jordans, them uh, Stone Wars Jordans yeah. or whatever they were. That's dope, man. But that was our beginning. That's how right. uh, we met was at the Rodian Swamp meet. And, and I, I like sharing that story because I believe that Steve's legacy is so rich that, uh, um, you know, that not only him hooking up with you guys there, but me hooking up with you guys there. And that's pretty much how my DJ career started was through that Rodium mixtapes to you, uh, with you. I remember I called you and you said, come through my house. And then we went to the house up there on South Central. Right. And uh, you had two turntables there. And uh, I was cutting it up, scratching and everything. You like the way I got down? And uh, at that time, if I'm correct, we you were already working on a song for Calvin Anderson right. VIP Records. Uh, um, do you remember how he got in contact with you to um, do that song? Well, I knew a dude named DJ Slice back in the day. And um, we was, you know, back in the day, he'd do a bunch of talent shows and okay. he'd run into people. And uh, I ran into him. And he had another dude that he was working with, and um, so he told me to come uh, to come to uh, to uh, VIP in Long Beach. So when I went to VIP and he was working with the dude that he had, I was like, well, I got another guy that know how to rap too. So uh, Calvin ended up liking the guy I had, and uh, that was day one with me and Calvin for for years. And you know, yeah, I, I, I remember we went to uh, uh, Echo Sound out mm -hmm. in Glendale. Uh, for, for the song you better think because mm -hmm. i was only a part of that one song and i met calvin uh uh but you know it it, it was just a dope time to because uh, i had already been going to vip records since i was a youngster with my brother uh, that either he would buy records from steve or buy records from calvin but that was my first introduction to calvin was was through you and that's how pretty much my vinyl uh if you will legacy started was with you and that's right. that's why my relationship with you has always been really special because that's the first time that i can actually say you know i scratched on a record right and you produced it right and, and what a lot of people don't know is that before i was ever high seas dj i was your dj right we was doing trying to do stuff and get it out there right right right, right, right. okay okay now um how how did you end up meeting steve yano well when dre was living with us um, they were they were already doing <clears throat> the rhodium swap meet mixes, but then when Dre came over, I think it was a little bit better for uh, Steve to to meet him there. So they would uh, come to the uh, come to my house early in the morning and be all day in there. And uh, you know, I was uh, kind of helping put the records away. You know, when you <laughs> making a mixtape and. Uh, uh, um, um, Steve would would actually be recording it, like so. We had right. a little track machine, and they'd just sit there all day, and they'd throw the records back, and you know, I earned my little keep. You remember I said for for the Wendy's, you right. know. Uh, uh, she, uh, she, Steve, she that story about Wendy's. St Steve used to always, you know, because when when he did the when they was doing the, the mixtapes, um, it would be early in the morning. So either I go to school, or I'll stay there all day. So I usually stay. I see Steve back the little van. He had a van. Back it up in the driveway, and then I know that if I help out, you know, carrying the crates in the house, and you know, I give me some free Wendy's. <laughs> and uh, Steve, we used to always go to Wendy's on, I think, it's Century and uh, and uh, Crenshaw a long time ago. We used to go there. So shout out to uh, Steve for giving me the Wendy's all the goddamn time. Go. Oh. <laughs> and then I find my way. If you you know you got I'm sure you got all the tapes and uh, I'll end up doing a on the wheels of steel Dr. Dre I'm searching from CIA I will find my way on the mixtapes yeah. every time. Well, well, that's when I first heard of you was rapping on those mixtapes. Right. And and I didn't know that was you at the time when I had first met you and I was like, damn, that's that dude right there. But but I knew immediately when I saw you on the uh, on the first drum machine that I ever seen you on was the SP twelve hundred. Right. And uh, um, you know, uh, how how did you get that SP twelve hundred? Because back then, what was it like two thousand bucks? Right. But the first, the, I used to have a bunch of drum machines. I had the the Doctor Rhythm, and the first one that I had that sampled. I remember my homeboy Papa J, recipes that Papa J was in the streets, and he used to get all you know how dope dealers get stuff, cassette players, and he gave me a, a drum machine to help him produce some music because uh, he was over there trying to get Dre to do it. And that was the DDD one when uh, uh, that was the first one I had. But 
back when Dre and uh, we was working on, you know, our, our the beginning stuff. Dre had the DMX, and then uh, Dre also had the Landrum and the Oberheim and stuff like that. And then the SB12 came later, okay. and then the SB12 was just what that was, and then the SB1200 came out after that. So the SB1200 was pretty much the the sampler of choice for the West Coast because you know East Coast used to use different kind of stuff, but when SB1200 came out, that changed everything. So. Uh, one day, Calvin was, um, well, Dre, I always used the Dre's, you know. And a funny story um, with me and DJ Poole and, um, and King T, Dre used to come home like late at night and then about 8, 7 in the morning, Poole and King T would come get the drum machine. So then they'll work on it all the way into the evening, bring it back, and then Dre would take it and go to the studio. So it was a lot of people using that drum machine. So, you know, they wouldn't let me use it at no point. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, he, 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 you can work on it, but he ain't too far away. You know, hear that, doop, what you doing? You know, hear the bad thing or whatever. Right. So uh, I, I convinced Calvin uh, to uh, to buy me one. So uh, Calvin didn't know me from a hole in the ground. He was like, hey, I was like, Calvin, you need to help me get this drum machine. You know, back in the day, drum machines, $90, you know, 30 hundred dollars whatever i told him it was two thousand dollars and that was in uh 80 87 88 uh about 88 he bought me a two thousand dollar drum machine i told him that it was going to change the world and uh lo and behold that drum machine did change the world it did it right. did man it did and believe me not just with me but just with right. what everything that calvin was doing at the time he was giving birth to the long beach world you know that's when long beach started coming on so I told, I showed Slice how to work the drum machine. And this is a story, y'all can check it out on the internet at DJ Slice. And he says, says how he uh, became one of the producers that came out of the VIP situation. So he was like, uh, I think he was mixing um, Computer Love and he was sampling it. And this one guy was over his shoulder was like, yo, what are you doing? Like, you know, people couldn't understand sampling back then. It was like, did you remake it? Like, how did this is? Right. And that guy turned into DJ Quick. You know what I'm saying? So, and then the other producers that came around and Warren G and all the whole situation. And come to find out the demo that Warren G did to get Dre, to get, for Dre to hear Snoop Dogg was made off that same drum machine. Same drum machine. Right. right. Well, you had said something that I thought was key. You said that that drum machine would change the world. Right. You're, you're absolutely correct, but I think you, you're, you on that drum machine coming out with that sound out of the West Coast was a huge part of changing that world. world. And that's just me speaking not only as a friend, but also as a fan. Oh, thanks. You know. Well, um, it, it, I, 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 you know, I'm a real humble person, and uh, it changed the way business happened you know because back in the day when you go to a studio you couldn't touch people's equipment like right. the the production came with the studio you know so when people start having the sb12 and sequencing and and, uh, and stuff like that then you can make your own music right. so the sb1200 was really the first home studio that you could do everything on except do vocals so that i knew it was going to change the world because I knew nothing else could compete with this at the size it was, what it did, how it retained information, how much information you can use to make a hit. Like there's number one, like you can't touch this and other songs, you know, from East Coast, West Coast, and they just samples, four minute, what, four second samples or something, 2.5 second samples that, that changed the world. They took a lot of the music out of high schools. So when they took those kind of situations away from us, this is what made R&B go astray because you had to know how to play the instrument. So when they took all of that out of high schools and band and they stopped giving money to um, show children what music is, the sampler took its place so they couldn't stop hip hop. They wanted to stop hip hop by not making us know how to play instruments. But when that SB 1200 came, they was confused. They didn't know what, they was like, how, what is this? What, what are you doing? Like, how did right. you take Steely Dan? You know, how did you do this? You know, and you know, with the uh, Rapper's Delight, a lot of that stuff was replayed. But then when we start being able to give the music of the quality of R&B, then rap music changed and that drum machine changed everything. Yes, yes. You know. Quick story, 
I remember when uh, Steve bought me my first drum machine <laughs> and he gave me the manual and it was like the size of a fucking phone book. And I was like, Steve, I ain't reading that bullshit. Right. And he says, then I'll just take you to Dre's. I guess at, at this time, Dre was living in Paramount, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dre, we set it up on the floor, the turntable, the mixer, the drum machine. And he's showing me how to sample. But Dre was teaching me how to do like an electro funk B, like right. <laughs> And uh, um, boom, kind of boom, 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 boom. And so, you know, he was just showing me the ropes. Mm -hmm. And we had went back there another time, and he was teaching me how to sample. And I remember I was thinking, well, shit, you know, Jinx is his cousin, so I'll call you up. Jinx, I need you to finish teaching me how to use it. Right. We went to pick you up, brought you back, but you were so damn fast. <laughs> you know, it, and I everybody, have a photographic everybody, memory. Everybody remember, everybody remember that. You know, but you were like, and I was like, dude, uh, like, I don't, I, are you going too fast? Just, just keep looking, keep looking. You take out the, take the get, get another right, floppy right. dish. And I was like, damn. But it, 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 hey, you know what? I used to, I used to uh, mess with people's heads because I had two of them. I ended up buying one, buying another one. I ended up buying, actually, two other people ended up buying, buying this drum machine for me. But when I, you know, got my little money or whatever, I went and bought another one and took the, the uh, words off of it. Okay. And then I got a sticker and put a pro edition. And everybody thought Yamaha gave me my own SV twelve hundred. Wow. And I just took the took the the, the sticker off the right the, the whole label. Yeah. On. So whoever looked at the drum machine, you need to know what two and the other one and the other thing. It, it was impossible. You would have to know it by heart. So I right. knew everything. Everything in those buttons had a, a, a definition to it. So I really didn't have to. I knew what I wanted. I knew what this is. You know, I, I know. I knew it. I knew it. So uh, it was actually too slow for me. You know what I'm saying? At some point, because you got to and you know, you got to wait. Then you know, then you get everything going. But uh, yeah, I, I knew it. Uh, Dre Dre's pretty much showed me how to how to uh, work it like that. Okay. You know, earlier you had shared with me a story about that song "Surgery" by Dre when you first heard it on mm -hmm. the radio. Can you right. share that with us? When uh, I don't think I was in seventh grade, I was used to get bussed out to the valley, and uh, you know, be early, early, early in the morning, and, and kids be sleep on the bus on the way, and then I'm sitting there just riding, and then I hear surgery on the radio. Man, that was like one of the best feelings, like <laughs> to hear hear something get made, and right. then you know, we never thought we would be on the radio. The radio was the biggest thing you could ever want, like to hear your stuff, and you're not there playing it with them, like they're playing it on their own. Right. And I was telling all our friends, I was trying to wake them up, like my cousin's in on the radio. They was like, no, it's not. <laughs> we don't know, no, you don't know him. You know, when you go into I mean, junior high school, you don't know nobody. Right, right. And right. kids will not believe you. Like. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, just to say my cousin, for those that may not know, I'll make it clear right now, he's talking about Dr. Dre being his cousin when right. he first heard surgery. That's an amazing story. Because uh, I still remember when I first heard my song in 1991 being played on the radio. I was in San Francisco. And we had just, we were just cruising down the street. We turned on KMEL and uh, they played it mm -hmm. and man it, it almost made my ass want to cry man mm -hmm. you know because i was thinking i came from the rodeo swami to the radio you know and i'm in frisco it's right. not like i'm in la you know but now let me ask you this as far wait, as the funny wait, one of the funny things when uh the first song i heard on the radio um was you can't play on my yo-yo I mean, we had other songs like, you know, with the Stereo Crew back in the day and She's a Skag and those songs. They did, they did get played on the radio. Right. But when I heard You Can't Play With My Yo-Yo, I was in Foot Locker and I was the only one enjoying it. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I was like, and I wanted to, like, you know how you try to make people look at you? Like, right. you know, you just wanted to, and nobody gave a fuck. <laughs> but I, I was an enjoyment I enjoyed by myself. But I was walking, I heard it through the mall. I was like, oh, my God. I was by myself. <laughs> you, you know what, Dreams? It, it was an amazing time that, that sometimes I have to paint a picture of something like that right. to share with my son. Right. Because everything now, you know, you could do a song, upload it on YouTube and hear it. Right, you right, know? right, right. But like what you said, to be able to hear your song on the radio where you're not there, but them just playing it on their own. Right. And to hear it, it's just an amazing, amazing feeling, man. You know, uh, um, but now, now, now let me ask you a question for those guys out there that love drum machines. Uh, uh, before the SP-1200, did you ever get used to the 808? 
Yeah. Yeah. Now, did it come easy to you or did it take a, a while? Uh, well, it was it was pretty pretty easy. Yeah. I mean, the lights, you know, how uh -huh. the lights went. So I was already always looking over Dre's shoulder. You know what I'm saying? He's another fast person that, you know, but the, your ultimate goal is to have something going. So it wasn't to learn the drum machine, it's to make it do what you want it to do. Yeah. So when you start dealing with the 808, and it was a little bit like the Dr. Rhythm, the 909s and that that world. Okay. So uh, most of the, the way you worked on drum machine was passed down. It wasn't too far away of how this works. You know what I'm saying? It's like driving a car. You know? Has a steering wheel, has a thing, has a metronome, it has keys, it has lights. And that's how the, uh, the rolling was but I, I think I did really good with the rolling. Okay. I did real good. But I like the Yamaha. I, I did more made more money with the Yamaha. Uh, I, I remember when I tried using the uh eight oh eight I keep in mind I went from turntables to the eight oh eight. I had never ever touched the drum machine before. Mm -hmm. And I was like I, I don't get this shit, you know, I don't get it. Right. So and then when the twelve hundred came I learned it by watching not only Dre but watching you. Mm -hmm. You know, and then eventually the next person uh, uh, that taught me and gave me all his sounds was DJ Quick. Right. You know, I mean, he gave me his whole library. So uh, I look back when people ask me, you know, uh, um, how did you learn? I look back and I think, okay, Dre, Jinx, and Quick all taught me how to use the SP-1200. Right. And I just think to myself, wow, you know, just that's just... Those guys right there, at least in my eyes, are legends, bro. Right. You know, and I know and you're a humble cat, and you don't really say things like that about yourself. But I, I'm gonna say them. Oh, I you know, appreciate it. You know, because I believe people like you many times go unrecognized or do not get the credit that I that they deserve because I'm a long, Even if I've never had met you, I'm a fan of every about your the body of work that you have done. I appreciate it. You know, for real. So it, um, wasn't, it wasn't an easy road. You know, you, you make mistakes and. Uh, in this music game, you, you you do full circles. You do, one day you do good with the beats, and next day you do terrible with the business. And next day you do good with the business and terrible with the beats. You know, so it's it's always a, a a fun journey dealing with this music. Yes, you know, I don't think I ever was defeated at no point doing music. Some okay. people get defeated, and I I don't think. I think everything I did was done for a reason, and I do appreciate every beat that I did, whether I like it a lot or like it barely. There's some beats that I do or have done that might not be my favorite beat because right. of the way the business was handled or, you know, it could be different things, but some of the beats, you know, I, I, I don't even feel like I did it. I listen to them like I'm a fan as well. Wow, wow. I forget, I forget wow. how I did it. I forget why I did it. I forget the emotions. And then when I hear it, it'd be like, uh, like, wow, like I heard, um, the track I did for Ice T and Q for, I think the Trespass movie, and I really didn't like that song, right? But when I heard it again, I was like, "That motherfucker's bumping!" Like, you know, I listened yeah. to it as a fan, and I forgot, I forgot how it sounded, I forgot uh, the whole thing, but I appreciate it now. So, you know. Wow. Uh, uh, now you had said earlier that the SP twelve hundred later on will change the world. Let me name something for everybody out there that loves vinyl, that loves drum machines, and loves that 80 sound. I'll tell you another thing that I believe that Steve introduced to the West Coast that I help, I believe helped change the sound of hip hop uh, or help move it forward was the Ultimate Breaks and Beat Records. Right. You know, I think all uh, 25 volumes. Right. You know. Uh, I have a story about that, but um, let me ask you this. When you got your copy, um, well, I know a couple of times you came to my house and you would just sample. I'm going to sample that. Come on. Right, right, right. And I was like, that's a dope ass sample. So when you left, I resampled sampled that shit myself. Right, too. right, right. You know, but uh, uh, do you believe that those ultimate breaks and beats were a big influence or were, were instrumental in forming our sound here right. on the West Coast? Well, I wouldn't say because they really came from the East Coast. The East Coast cats was using them first. But once again, like I said, it it picked up the void where we couldn't play trumpets, or we couldn't. But I used to play trumpet, so um, and it just took that void away from hip hop. Because back in the day, when you listen to like the Deary Vets and you know, Just Ice, and you go back to them type of beats, they was you know KRS. Dun, 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 dun. It, it it wasn't a, it, the the songs didn't have a body to it because we didn't know how to create music. So when the sampling came, it made the song seem real, like it was a real song. Because at first, 
when we first did rap music, the beats made it sound rinky dink. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it, it, it you know, it, it was, it was, it was kind of, you know, I wouldn't say, uh, like Mickey Mouse kind of like, okay. you know, but the, the substance of the raps were dope, but the music wasn't. So when the sampling came into play, it just made all the music sound so much real, like the R&B, like the jazz, that we wasn't getting credit for. We wasn't getting credit for being good artists back in the day with the uh, R&B, the jazz, rock, country. They gave us no props until we started sampling and then the music started being real like their music because they knew how to play music. Most rap artists, the rap producers, wasn't pianists. It, I was always saying that most R&B people were failed gospel people that ended up being the body of hip hop music because okay. hip hop music didn't really have musicians. We had drummers. We didn't have keyboard players. That was always, you know, somebody else that worked at the church or somebody <laughs> that, you know, that will be on my stuff, you know, bass player. Hey man, come to the studio, you know, have your uncle in there and then everybody, the music just became so real when the SB12 and the Overheim um, back in the day, uh, when that came, it, it changed the world. Rap was now a style of music rather than just, you know, that soundtrack of the b little boy with the with the with the boombox with the dog. With the, you know what I'm saying? It, right. it became real. It became Luther Vandross. It became, you know, when Dre did uh, Gangsta Gangster. Like when you, when you start going and you know, doom, 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 doom. but at some point that was still a sample. And people kept going, it became fuller and fuller. And then you listen to the, you know, um, True to the Game, how I did True to the Game and how it's layered and it's big. It sounds like it, but most of that, all that shit was samples. Dope, dope. <laughs> I mean, because I remember when I first got the Ultimate Breaks and Beats, I played like in Peace of Present. I was like, oh shit, Dana Dana. I skipped another one. Oh shit, that was Carrier's one. Right. Oh shit, that was Tessa Sonic. Right. But just to be able to have that collection. And, and many times, even if we didn't sample it, we could take a kick, we could take a snare. Right, right. And right. it went perfect with the sp12 because uh, uh one thing that that a lot of us did we would sample that shit on 45 and then slow it down and right. it gave it that sound right you the know truncation sound yeah the truncation sound because i heard a lot of that sound coming mm -hmm. on your stuff and i right. loved it it's funny because today there are people that ask me where did that sound come from right and you, you have to have a sp12 well it was terrible sound basically yes. <laughs> it was 8-bit i think it was yeah but now that's what people call old school, you right. know. So, you well, know. I, 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 the one thing that was dope about the SB twelve hundred is you were dope because you were limited, and a limited production makes crazy dope music when you have too many options. Today, with the computer and the, you know the reasons and the, you know the Ableton and and all these other stuff, people have so many options. So it's not as dope as back in the day. Like back yes. in the day, you only had 2.5 seconds yes. per pad. If you wanted then you use that up, it's over with. You had to produce a dope song with that five, five second sampling. You had to come out to make something out of it to where now, you know, it's endless. So it's not really that impressive when you have endless sample time. You know, it was only dope when you only had a certain amount of sample time and then like, it was the ASR-10 and the Akai, I think the Akai 1000, and when they started doing stereo sampling, and you only get so much on that. So that's why the, the Public Enemy Beats and the Dana Danes, and the, well, the Slick Rick and the Dana Danes, and those kind of productions was dope because they was limited they to were. what you can add to the track to make it dope, you know? So yeah. when I was doing stuff with Cube, um, we, we would use two drum machines, so, this, I would have enough sampling for two of them. I sync them together and play one. The other one to play, and then the sample will be here. And then the end of the sample, the turnaround. That was a whole nother drum machine playing wow. two at a time. So we started having more MP. I mean SP twelve hundreds on you know. Yeah. Why, why we're syncing this we're laying this track but we you know everything is on your mark get set and all of it plays you know with that especially with the mpc 60 yeah because the MP, 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 mpc 60 was the controller so you midi them all together and then get the empty tone and as soon as that thing play the whole thing light up you're like don't touch nothing you know don't touch nothing. Yeah. that was our little secrets you know yes. we didn't do double passes we'll make the whole song play 
at one time, like that's for, awesome bro. when we land it, you know. That's awesome. All right, brother. Well, listen. Here's what I'm gonna do. We're yeah. Gonna, we're gonna press pause right there, and we're gonna go take a little beer run, and uh, we're gonna come back to Rodium Radio. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Hope you guys are being educated. This is my brother, Sir Gene. Gives yeah. about 10 minutes. And uh, we'll be right back. Call somebody, text somebody, slap somebody, let them know that Sir Jinx is on Rodium Radio. We'll be back in a minute. Yeah, yo. These right here are the ultimate breaks and beats. These were introduced to the West Coast by Steve Yano. They came from the East Coast to the West Coast and they were sold only at the Rodium. You can still see the Rodium sticker there. And these are called, once again, the ultimate breaks and beats. If you're a DJ or a producer, you better know what these are. If not, don't call yourself a DJ or a producer. Me and Hi-C right here, we know about these. Back in the day, I would have doubles of everything. Uh, here's a quick story. When Ice Cube left NWA, he came over to my pad. And I was playing some beats for him. Before he left to New York to do his album, America's Most Wanted, he actually... Uh, um, Asked me if he can borrow a set of my uh, Ultimate Breaks and Beats. I let him borrow it, never saw the dude again, man. I guess that's what he meant by jacket for beats. But you know what? <laughs> Much love to Ice Cube. He helped put not only Compton, South Central, but West Coast on the map. So much love to him. But once again, these are the records that Steve introduced to the West Coast. You don't believe me? Ask Dr. Dre. to get funky fresh music easy motherfucking e and my homeboy dr dre mc ren is in effect and you know we don't play the rhodium is hitting but you know you can't leave until you get a deaf ass tape from steve oh steve oh steve oh steve just give me just one more tape oh steve oh steve oh steve just give me just one more tape oh steve oh steve oh steve just give me just one more tape oh steve oh steve oh steve just give me just one more tape yeah man i came all the way down to the rhodium Growing up in the 80s, you know, DJing, turntablism, hip hop in general was so competitive, you know, that we were always looking to hear what other DJs were doing so we could kind of gauge where our level was. And that's when I heard of guys like Joe Cooley and Tony A and um, seeing the stuff they were doing, you know, the Rhodium mixtapes and uh, D Joe Cooley coming on KDAY. I was like, that's why I knew, like, that's okay, that's how I got to be. That's why I got to. Those were the guys I looked up to. Those were the guys that kind of set the mark for. Uh, the DJ competitiveness in Los Angeles at that time. It never just ended with the DJing, it always would advance and uh, you know just into producing and uh, these are the machines Tascam actually made four tracks and eight tracks which allow you to take a standard cassette, pop it in there and then record you know layering song after song and that's the way guys like Tony A and Dr. J were able to make those rhodium tapes was using a machine like a Tascam uh, multi-track recorder. Yeah, growing up in Southern California, we didn't have too many outlets as to where we can find new music. I mean, we had one radio station, you know, that sounded really staticky. And, uh, you know, so, you know, when mixtapes circulated, you know, everyone was eager to see what, let's see what's on here, what's on here. And uh, 
when I finally ended up getting a hold of uh, one of the Rodeo mixtapes, it happened to be the uh, 88 Boom and Bass, which I have a funny story about that. Um, but yeah, Boom and Bass, uh, 88 Boom and Bass, to me, was just like groundbreaking. I mean, the way he uh, was structuring those mixes, I mean, I, I didn't know. I mean, it was, I was 12 years old or 14, whatever I was at the time. Um, we had no internet, no, no Google, so we didn't know. I thought the Rodeum was a nightclub based on what I was listening to on, on those tapes. I mean, it sounded like Tony had four, six turntables set up and he had records queued up and he had Easy e and Ice Cube coming through and doing intros or shining them out. I mean, as a kid, that's what I was envisioning because that's what, you know, those tapes were painting a picture in my mind as to that's what I envisioned. So a few years later, when I came up on some money, I mean, the first major purchase I made as far as studio equipment would be, uh, I would say my Yamaha 4-track. I mean, it, until that day, I was still very much influenced as to the approach that Tony took in making those tapes. Because literally, I mean, they had a whole series of tapes, and a lot of them had uh, uh, duplicate songs, but that didn't matter because each tape was presented and packaged and presented in, in, in a different fashion. So it's like watching 10 movies with the same actors, and you get something different out of each movie. I mean, that's how good these tapes were put together and even back then I mean with the technology that was so limited I mean that took a lot of work funny story about 88 boom and bass though is uh, one day I was getting ready to do a gig and uh, my friend came over to pick me up he brought some guys who I didn't know who they were but one of the guys gave me a tape and again back then that's how stuff circulated I mean it's not like we had YouTube to find the next mix or anything like that so I saw the tape um, it had somebody's name and it had their uh, their phone number. You know, fast forward, we get into the car. We're heading over to the gig. Um, I had a couple drinks uh, before I got into the car, and uh, on my way to the gig, and I popped in the tape, and it was '88 Boom and Bass. I was like, "This ain't Tony." I was like, this guy was flat out using Tony A's tape, and I don't know why he would do that because Tony had you know drops and references to his name all over that mix but yet this guy was still using that tape and putting his name on it and using it as a as a promotional tool which to this day that's still frowned upon you don't take other people's work and capitalize on it yourself i mean do your own thing i mean i respect everyone's hustle but you don't, you don't do that and even back then i was really i was really upset to where you know, i had the guy's phone number I ended up calling him and I gave him a piece of my mind. I mean, I was so livid that this guy must have thought that it was actually the Tony A calling him, telling him, giving him the business. But, you know, so Tony, I know it's almost 30 years later. You know, I apologize if you ever got into an altercation or if uh, anyone approached you about some threats that may or may have not been made over the phone a few years back. But, uh, you know, it's, it's an unwritten code and out of the respect I had, you know, I felt personal obligation from one DJ to another to take care of that for you, man. I grew up in Mar Vista in the 70s and 80s, 90s. Right around 88, I got my first uh, Radio Shack mixer and started to learn how to DJ on some belt drive turntables. And uh, one of my friend's brothers was a DJ already, and he made a copy of the one of Tony A's tapes for us. And we just sat there and listened to it. How's he doing it? Is like three different beats going on at the same time with a different acapella. Um, all the rappers that were big at the time, you know, needless to say, NWA, but also like High C and those dudes and Candyman would be on him on uh, on these uh, tapes doing alternate versions and personalized versions. It was just a shit, man. The composition was excellent on those tapes, and it really inspired me to uh, step up my game. Thank you, Tony. Peace. Just do one, two, one, two. Right about now, Easy E and Dr. Dre's in the motherfucking house. Times are getting crazy. It's really hard to choose it. The Rhodium's a spot to get funky, fresh music. Easy motherfucking E and my homeboy, Dr. Dre. MC Ren is in effect, and you know we don't play. The rhodium is hitting, but you know you can't leave Until you get a deaf ass tape from Steve Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape Yeah man, I came all the way down to the rhodium swap beat man To pick up one of them WA tapes man And I talked to homeboy Steve down there man And he said I'm fresh out of tapes man Fuck you, fresh out of taste, man. He say cause they sellin' like hotcakes and shit, man. Got my man going down. Hey, mom, what's for dinner? 
Yo, welcome back everybody to Rodin Radio. I'm with my good friend, Sir Jinx in the building. Sir, please. We're gonna go ahead and jump right back into it because I don't wanna waste any time. So you were just telling me right now, rapping on those mixtapes was one of the right. best things. Yeah. Tell me, is you, tell me why. Uh, when you're dealing with music and, you know, Dre and, you know, Eric and all those, they was way older than me. Yeah. So they was kind of like, you know, like the older brothers I didn't have. So when you get treated like that, you know, there's an age difference. So for them to let me be a part of that, that was just always like, you know, your big brother, you, you never, you never can go to the party. And then one day he say, come on. And then you like, oh, wow, you know, it's child, you know, child mentality, you know, that that was a, a reason to kept going, to keep going. Right. You know, it wasn't a letdown. It was a, it was, I was where I was supposed to be, whether right. it's good or whether it's corny or whatever, you dial the clock all the way back and, and Jinx was there. There's no doubt about it that I was there. You That's know, dope. Playing my part, too. Well, your voice will forever live on on those mixtapes and... I tell people all the time, I believe one day, if they ever really truly do open a, uh, a hip hop museum, I believe that those mixtapes, that body of mixtapes will be on there in, in that museum. Right. Uh, um, and, and you're gonna be a part of that, you know. Well, the, the, one of the dope things is that Steve always got the new records. So Steve was the one that got the beats and breaks and kept getting them. So, uh, you know, it, it wasn't just us, it was, <clears throat> You know, Steve, uh, you know, was in the record pools and deal with stuff. So um, on the mixtape, Dre would give a lot of people a chance. So, yes. so they wasn't out. You know, they was just like now, like you could just pick a bunch of rappers and be like, OK, this is mumble rap time. You know what I'm saying? But you 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 would still have to choose some. Some of them are not as good as others. So when Dre was doing those and it was a transition between you know, the techno sounds, you know, the we, we're only bugging and then, you know, Twilight 22s and, and that, that world, you know, it was a transition going from those kind of music, Baseline and um, Odyssey, you know, two, uh, 2001, Boogie or whatever. But the rest of the stuff, you had to give it a chance. It was no promotion to it. It wasn't, oh, check out the new, you know, uh, you know, ugly girls be quiet. Uh, check out. It wasn't none of that. They just came, and it, if you if Dre liked them, he was giving everybody a chance. So it was, it was a little more than just doing the NWA stuff and putting our stuff on there. He was pretty much like um, it was open for whoever had music out at that time. You know, you know. Uh, quick story about that. Um, I remember when I was at your house and Dre pulled out a two short record. And it was on that, uh, I think it was the Born to Mac album, mm -hmm. um, the, the one with Freaky Tales. Mm -hmm. And I remember he's, he's kind of pressed stop on the SP-1200, I mean, on the t Technique 1200, and he scratched this uh, Too Short in. And then he gets on the mic and he says, yeah, this is my boy Too Short from, you know, up north or whatnot. And then after I asked him, um, I said, you know, do you know him? And he said, no, he goes, but I like it. Right. He said, and, and that's kind of what you're saying is, he was giving him a chance right. to be heard out here. He goes, but it's not so much that he is a dope rapper. He goes, but it's, it's his voice and it's not what he's saying, but it's how he's saying it. Right. And those little things always stuck to me. And it did. He, you know, this guy ended up blowing the hell up. Yeah. You know, but and, st uh, and still is still, still is still going strong. Still going short. strong. Shout out to Two Shirt. Man. Yes, absolutely. You know, Shout I did out to say nothing but a word, so I got my little piece in with uh, <laughs> um, with uh, with Two Shirt. I, I got a platinum plaque with him. No, uh, bitch ain't nothing but a word. You guys could look that up. As a matter of fact, if Two Shorts ever listen to this, I want to get you on the show. Uh, um, so hopefully we can make that happen one day. Yeah, Two Shorts, do it. You're cool, it's cool, it's cooler than a fan. Man. You know, um, we were talking a couple of days ago, and you were telling me about there are certain people in this record industry that are very close or very dear to you as far as relationship wise. And one of the guys that you had mentioned was Isaac Hayes. Right. You, you could uh, talk, elaborate a little bit more about that relationship? Well, what happened was I was going through like, you know, if you're a producer, I, I, I go through like periods that I, I, I think of different type of music and then I, I want it to be as real as it gets. So I was really trying to redo like a Curtis Mayfield kind of feel track. And um, <clears throat> so when we did the song and I, I submitted it to my publishing company because I was just letting them hear it. 
And then everybody was like, you know, that, that guy sounds like Isaac Hayes. I was like, yeah, I was trying to go for that kind of feel. And one girl named Candy, she was like, I know Isaac Hayes. And I'm like, for real? She was like, yeah, she got him on the phone. And I was like, oh, I was at all. I felt like I was a little kid. And, you know, you got to hold your composure. And, you know, you're like, hi, you know. And he said, hey, what's going on, man? You know. And uh, we flew to Memphis. And uh, he liked the song. And uh, he ended up performing on uh, a song I got called All for the Money, All About the Money. And uh, it's like a 70s kind of feel, kind of track. But, you know, this was way before he was a chef on uh, South Park or whatever. And it was like that kind of time where, you know, an artist goes through a transition where nobody don't be really, you know, checking for him like right. that. And I just felt like I was doing something good. I, I, he got paid. He loved it. We hung out there for maybe like a week. And uh, I learned a lot about him. He's like a real good mentor dude. And uh, Isaac Hayes, man, rest in peace, man. He was a real good dude. Rest in peace. You, you know, for, uh, again, for those people that like equipment, that like drums, for those people that go to the NAM every year, mm -hmm. what, what, what kind of equipment did you use to produce that song? Uh, the, uh, I was, uh, I don't know. Uh, NPC maybe I think it was the NPC days but it was live I had the drums was from a drum machine but the music was all live music okay that's why he liked it because it was a uh, kind of taken like you know dun -dun 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 -dun. it was like his world like so I tried to make the music like his world so I was probably like the I don't know I have I had so many uh rack mounts so it was like a lot of rack mounts uh okay that i used uh i can't remember them but okay. uh, you know what a rack mount is of course. i don't know well today everything's on a laptop <laughs> right, so right, right, right. rack mounts look it up google mount. it right right um another person that you mentioned was uh gerald lavert right uh, 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 uh share with us a little bit about that well i was working on this track and i was trying to um like we was trying to get signed i was trying to Get, get a record deal so I was trying to make something real positive so I end up doing a track called the picnic and the picnic is uh, a re you know a rendition of a uh, uh, re family reunion with uh, with the OJs right so um, this kind of funny the same guy that was singing on the all for the money was singing the Gerald Avert father part you know it's so nice to see so uh, I went to a club and was hanging out, and I saw Joe Levert, and I'm like, "Was was better than to ask him? What what, what can he say?" And uh, I walked up to him. He was real cool, and I was like, "Man, we in the studio right now. You come to the studio and come check it out. Check the song out." We left the club, went to the studio, uh, uh, recorded the song. I got him paid too, and uh, that me and him was friends ever since. You know, shout out to Big Joe. That was the dude that was his uh, security guard at the time. But uh, it'd be so funny. People back at my house and somebody would knock on the door. And Joe LaVert walks in, you know, everybody be like, James, you know everybody. <laughs> and uh, me and Joe LaVert was real good friends, man. And we made some good magic together. And I redid his father's song. So he sounds just like his father. I thought that was a, a, a good thing out of that song. Y'all check it out. It's uh, um, Picnic, Sir Jinx Picnic. Though, though, you know, it, I, I love the fact that you said he's there. Why not just ask him? Right. You know, right. Uh, my boy John one day gave me a quote, actually a little speech. Uh, it was called The Power of Asking by Steve Jobs. And he said, mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt to ask, just right. ask. And you did that, man. Uh, I mean, I'm, I mean, when you when you're an artist, I mean, you can swallow all that. I mean, you if you don't if you don't say it, you can't. You know, you don't get nothing out of it. So, you know, the worst thing that a person can do is just say no. Uh, you know, so I'm not scared to talk to anybody. I never was. I'm not a groupie. I don't. You know, my conversation short. Keep it short. Keep it brief. You remember we made the song "Get Off My Dick." Tell your bitch to come here for niggas that was talking too long. So yeah. I, I play by my own scripts, and uh, I see somebody I like. I walk up to him and say, what's up? I, I remember I was at a, 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 a restaurant in, uh, in, uh, in North Hollywood, called, I think it's called Casa Vega, right? And um, so I'm looking across the room and this, look, this guy is looking at me, right? So I'm, I'm just playing it off. I know who he is, but it was a, um, 
he just walked over and, and said what's up to me and i'm at all oh, is uh what's his name um uh he make all the faces boo, boo, boo. <laughs> what's his name Gerald? Gerald something but it was just the magic of music made me and him start talking he knew i was in into the music and i know it was um Damn, he just passed. Away okay, too. we'll come back to that. But it was just that energy, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, he, he could have been stuck up too, you know what I'm saying? What was his name? Gerald? Gerald, uh, uh, I forgot his name. That's going to be fucked up over this. Okay, we'll come back. But uh, it was uh, uh, it was just that kind of magic. And, uh, you know, you never should be, uh, you know, afraid to express yourself because, you know, the day you open your mouth, the day you get paid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody else that you uh, talked about to me uh, and you shared that you had a relationship with him, a good relationship with musical relationship. And to me, I was real intrigued by this one because, you know, uh, this guy to me, I mean, when I first heard his record, I was in seventh, eighth grade, which is Al Jarreau. Al Jarreau. Oh, okay. Al Jarreau. Yeah. <laughs> Al, Al Jarreau. Al Jarreau. Sorry. No. I was going to get to me, but it was just so dope that I knew who he was. Yes. And I'm just like trying not to look at him. And then he, just, next thing I know, he's standing here. Hey, how you doing, man? He's like an older guy, but go ahead. It's, well, well Al Jarreau, actually, I was introduced to him as far as his record mm -hmm. from uh, my brother. Right, you know? right, right. But um, uh, the other person you were talking about to me was Roger Troutman. Right. Please share with us on that one. Well, I was dealing with uh, Warner Brothers. I think they, he was with Warner Brothers or something at the time. And a lady named Karen Jones, and you know, shout out to Benny Medina and the whole staff over there, because they used to throw me remixes. Like, you know, I did a, a dude named Trey Lou, that's um, uh, George Clinton's son, and uh, you know, I was doing remixes, remixes, and they was like, uh, "You, you want to do a remix for Roger?" And I'm like, "Yeah, right." <laughs> so, because they asked me, and I, I, I don't say yeah like that, but I'd be like, "Yeah, I check it out." You know, I'm excited inside. So uh, they set up a, um, a studio thing, a uh, studio session for us at, uh, it, it was Westlake, but it was the other Westlake, like close to, um, it was two Westlakes at the time, close, close to the Beverage Center. And uh, Roger came in and uh, technically I did Roger Troutman's, Roger Troutman's last song. So the last song he did was a song called Everybody Get Up. That was a song that me and him produced together. Wow. And then he did the California Love stuff. But even with Gerald LeVert, I worked with him first, and then everybody started working with him. And, you know what I'm saying, I worked with Roger Troutman and, you know, of course, the Tina Marie situation. But they were just at Limbo, and I cared about them, you know. So um, Roger Troutman even gave me the little speaker that he do the talk box thing with, cause he all the amps and the way people do it now is new. Right. And he would actually break a speaker open and put a tube down in and add a battery, and that's how he'll do it. So if you ever got one of those, it's crazy, cause I still have mine in, in storage. Wow. But um, he brought up more bounce. He brought the reels to more bounce. But uh, when you listen to Roger Troutman's production. It's all over the place, you know what I'm saying? So when you bring up a song, like when we bring up a song, it's usually put together. But he he, he almost knew how to do music the way we record on, photo, on, on, on Pro Tools. So he'll record in one place, you know what I'm saying? It won't be like, oh, the vocal is these tracks. It'll be anywhere, right? And he'll just, it'll be anywhere in the song. So when you bring the song up, it's a lot of stuff that he didn't use. So you gotta find the song. Oh, shit. Right, 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 right. So he's doing vocals here. He's just me in right there. And he'll, he'll, woo, and do that. And he'll, woo, bo, 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 bo. And you'll be like, wow, run it back, do it again. And he'll just feel that whole part up. But now when he goes further down the track, it could be 16, 17, 18, 19, to where he did that on four, five, six, seven, eight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then the beat is in here, and the beat stops. The guitar plays on the same vocal track. You know, he was just all over the place. but. Working with Roger Troutman, he was a real cool dude. He, he, if, if he had a, a blue shirt on, he had a blue tie. If he had a blue tie, he had a blue jacket. 
We had blue jacket, blue pants, blue shoes, everything, one color. Wow. <laughs> Every day, different color. If it was red, red shirt, red tie, red thing, red hat. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he'd come to the studio dressed up. I was like, man, I need to go to the studio dressed up now. You know, right, he kind of, right. but uh, he's a real cool dude, real quiet type of dude, but uh, he had talked to you. Wow, dude. I, I remember I saw him on that BET and he was playing a little bit. All right. The old school one, yes, right? the, yes, the rerun with yes. uh, Donnie Simpson. I think yes, it was. Right, right, right. and I tell you what, it was fucking amazing, bro. Because right. you know it's funny because the way a lot of Chicano rappers today rap, they they'll either sample more bounce. Right. Th that's like the holy grail, <laughs> right, you know, right, of right, Chicano right. rap. Okay, right. or if they don't do that. They'll just take the clap, you know, the mm -hmm. snare, and then have somebody play talk box over it. Right. You know, so in so many, in an essence. Uh, uh, Roger is like a damn saint to a lot of us, you know. Right. You know, but yeah, Roger was freaking amazing, bro. I I I, uh, I remember the first time when I heard Grapevine, and I already knew the song Grapevine, and I didn't know you can do other people music over. <laughs> like, right, right. So when he did Grapevine over, I was like, oh man, that was that was a, a good time the, in my the, life. That is probably my all-time favorite. Uh, uh, Roger song right. Grapevine, especially the album version when it starts off. Oh, 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 oh. that shit right there. Right, right, right. Oh my goodness! I, bro. I, I think mine would probably be. Um, oh, it is in um, Computer Love. I think I like Computer Love. Yeah, best. yeah. of course, of course. You, you, you know, it, it's um, it's Shout funny. Out to Charlie Wilson. Charlie Wilson, because you know he sung that. Did he? That's the lead singing. Lead singing guy on Computer Love is Charlie Wilson. Well, I, I'm glad you shared that. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here in front and say, yeah, I knew that. Charlie Wilson and Shirley Murdoch. They was the two singers on it. Charlie on the, Wilson and Shirley Murdoch. Wow. Uh, she sung most of all the backgrounds with Roger Troutman. But on the computer love, if you listen to it, you be like, oh, shit, that's goddamn Charlie Wilson. Wow. Wow. Okay. Computer. Wow. You can hear it. You, know, you can hear it. Yeah, it's Charlie Wilson. Shout out Charlie Wilson one more time. That's, that's, that, that's amazing, bro. I mean, I could sit here and talk to you about Roger Troutman, but uh, um, you, you know what's funny? When you listen to More Bounce, it's probably, well, how long is a long version? About 10, 15 minutes long? So, well, it couldn't have been longer than 12 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay, let's just say 12 minutes. Because the reels are only 15 minutes. Right, you're right. You're right. At the time. So let's just say it was thir 12, 13 minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. We could have bumped that motherfucker all the way through, right, right. okay? Today, you can't wait for some of these new booty ass songs to hurry up and be over with, bro. You know? um, well, it, it wasn't too many selections. So back in the day, people had to pretty much listen to what was offered to where it's too many selections today. And uh, you have too many options. And some of the music is not uh, well thought out. No. Some people think just because you rhyme, you rapping. And that's not the case. Right. And uh, some people don't put effort to their music. And uh, when you look back in them days, you know, uh, you had to have musicians. And uh, that's why they made them songs that long. I, I remember I went to a house party out in Compton years ago. Of course, I was a teenager. Tommy Dog just came out the long version. Right. 12, 14 minute long song. Right. Everybody's freaking. Everybody's musty. Your drawers are sticking to you. And they're mm -hmm. all dancing, okay? Right. The song's about to end. Everybody will play it again. What? They just play that motherfucker over again. Well, back in the day, I talked to uh, George Clinton. He was a good friend of mine. He's a very smart man. And what they used to do is do what we do now. So they were looping the tracks then. Wow. So they would play one part, cut the whole two inch, and extend it. So they didn't play the songs that long either. So oh, they didn't do that all the way through either. They was bouncing those all the way down. <laughs> So he was like, that's how we did it. We, we would cut the entire two inch. Well, we would call splice. Right, right, right. Well, they splice a whole two inch and line it up. And Knee Deep was born, a 15 minute Knee Deep. That was wow. the one, Aqua Boogie and all of them. They kept doing that over and over. And it was like the women that were singing on the tracks, you know, shout out to Don Sylvia back in the day. Uh, it'd probably be like three or four people. And they just keep stacking it, keep stacking it, keep stacking it until it, whoa, it sound, he said he wanted to sound like a chorus of people without having them. So he didn't have a chorus. He just knew yeah. that people knew how to octave sing. So they, or the whole one pass would be this key, 
And then they'll go and do another key. Then they add another key. Then they add another one. And then it just sounds, what we would do today when you use different tracks for uh, Pro Tools, how you stack it like that. Right. Knee Deep was born. Wow. So they were do actually, in a sense, uh, doing what we do today, but back then, but cutting, splicing. Right. But the dope part is you're only as dope as your equipment. And now everybody got the same equipment. So this is why that was amazing because they were doing what they knew how to do with the equipment. And everybody else, um, you know, was doing it their way. And, and they were successful at it. But right, right now, everybody kind of piling out of the same door, doing the same techniques. And you do the same thing, the music going to sound the same. So. I, I remember, I, I forgot where we were at, but I think we were somewhere eating. And you told me the reason why music sounded better back then is because we had less. Right. You know, we had less to work with or whatever. Right. So it, it, it somewhat forced you to be creative, right. you know. We, I mean, you had 2.5 seconds on the SP-1200, a total of 10 seconds. So you had right. to create a song within 10 seconds. No, five seconds. Okay, five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> 2.5 per pad, four yeah. pads, right, right, right. Yeah, wow. But we did more with less back in them days. You know, a lot of people get too many options. And options are not always good, you know? Uh -huh. Okay. Who, who would you say would be dope? A guy that comes into a town and takes it over with all kind of artillery and tanks and stuff, or a dude that takes over the town with one goddamn pistol? <laughs> one goddamn pistol. <laughs> right. He's tough as a fuck. I call him the, the pill rider. <laughs> right, Please right. help me. So that's how I feel about doing music. The least you have is more impressive. Yes. You know what I'm saying? When you like the Don't Worry, Be Happy to Bobby McFerrin, he just did this. So it's how simple can you make this song? So he made it the simplest, you know, besides yeah. Shy and Ooh, Na 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 when it's just acapella, that's amazing. If you can sell a record without no music in, it's amazing. But when you start putting too much, too much stuff in a song, the direction of it, is different it, 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 you know you can't be on a tropical island and in a club you know what i'm saying you can't be you know in a bed with a girl and dancing you know it, it's too many options when you have too many options the actual person won't get it like a person that would like it i always say there's never a, a, a jamaican guy a rap guy a country guy and an r and an r&b singer hanging out together so if your song is going through those too many, many changes, somebody going to leave the room. You know what I'm saying? The Jamaican dude going to leave when the country dude do it. The country dude going to leave when the rap do. So you know what I'm saying? When it's too many, too many out ways to make music, I think it lessens the impact of what the song really means. So if you have too many options, most of the time people, you know, you, you know, you fall off a topic, you know, like we're getting off a topic. When it's made, when a song is made, it, it can't go too many directions you right, know what i'm saying right. if it go too many directions you'll lose the consumer that actually don't know how to play you know we don't want to go through a bunch of emotions you know i want to keep this one emotion i want to be happy in front and sad when you're doing a monologue at the end it's too much right. so back in the day we kind of stuck to what the premise of the song was and we were like oh we want this part oh this part gonna be a dropout with a disco part in it, you know what I'm saying? It just went too. Music now is going too many different directions to me. Okay. Good, to where we kind of step stuck on the same. We had a purpose. We was trying to beat R&B. We was trying to beat jazz. We was trying to make a mark. And uh, a lot of the songs kind of stayed on point to where some of the songs now is just all over the place. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you spoke on it, brother. Yeah. Uh, you shared with me this last person right here, which uh, I had a. I had an opportunity, as a matter of fact, me and Mellow Man uh, had an opportunity to work with her, and it was Tina Marie. Right. Share with us about your relationship with Tina Marie. Um, I had this song, any of the minds gonna always start off like that, but I had a song, and um, I think I did, uh, must be the magic, no, no, uh, magic, do 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 magic or whatever so uh <clears throat> back in the day it was a club called peanuts back in the day and it was like a, a girl gay club right so everybody be at the club you can go in there find two girls if your mouth is right you know if you go in there they wouldn't let dudes in they was I mean, the eddie murphy's the you know the the jamie foxes the will smiths the everybody all them kind of dudes get in so i saw her at the club right right so i'm like yo I look, I look up to you and da 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 da. da. Here's my number. 
uh, call me. I would love to work with you. And then one day I'm at the studio and I hear a phone, call, phone ring. I pick up, hello. She's like, hi, this is Tina. I'm like, Tina who? T Tina Marie. Man, get off my line. I hung up, hung up on her. She called back. Why you hang up on me? Like, it wasn't the same lady. <laughs> like, right, right, right. It's like, why you hang up on me? Like, her voice changed. I said, what is this? She was like, this is Tina. I was like, oh, shit, Tina Marie. Oh. She was like, why the fuck you hang up on me? I was like, oh, I'm so fucking sorry. Ooh. So uh, she got my address, came through, uh, knocked down a couple of songs. And one thing I could say about Tina Marie is that she never messes up. She never messes up in the studio. She only do stuff she don't like. But it never be like, Ehh! it never be no shit like that. You be like, ooh, keep that. You know, she's right, like, right. no, I'll do it again. Keep that. You know, yeah, keep exactly. That. <laughs> he talks to the engineer like, da, da, da. And this is B, B roll, B roll, B roll, B roll. We kept everything, but uh, she, she'll prove us wrong. Like, hey, I erased that. She killed it on that one. But she was a perfectionist. And uh, every time she uh, get on the, um, get on the mic, she, she, she just sings so unorthodox. You can't predict where she's gonna go. She do her harmonies. She kind of works like Roger Troutman a little bit. Like she know what key is missing. So she'll go back and like, oh, let me add this note. And then she'll add another another level to the harmony. And it, it, it'd be something you wasn't even goddamn thinking of. Right. 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 That's how deep she knew her voice that, 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 that deep. But the crazy part um, that me and her got a kick out of is um, I used to live um, La Cienega in Centinella, right? So um, it was like a street called Harden Drive, like Harden, Harden and Glenway. And it was a lot of people that, that came up from over there. And um, so when, uh, when I moved there uh, a long time ago, uh, people already knew the people that was there before me. So my, the apartment building we was in was like right here. There's another apartment building right here. So it's two stories and then there's one in the back here and there's one in the back here. Tina Marie ultimately did Square Bitch, Young Love, all that out of that apartment building. Out of that apartment building. And I, when I met her, I was like, "Was you? did you used to live over there? She was like, yeah. So me and her lived in the same place 10 years apart from each other, but ended up meeting each other later. Wow. <laughs> she was like, yeah, I used to live over there. She told me all the songs uh, uh, she produced out of there, Young Love, Portuguese. Uh, 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 Casanova Brown, I think, and uh, Square Biz, and I was like, wow. So that apartment building is next to mine, is the same place I did Once Upon a Time in the Projects. Yo, you can't play my yo yo. Like all them songs that I did in the beginning of my career with Cube, them two albums were made next door to each other on the same street, just 10 years apart. Amazing. <laughs> you know, uh, to share something with you. Me and Melo worked with her, I want to say 97, 98, somewhere around there. Uh, we redid, uh, I produced a song where I, I did a song, uh, Loving You by Minnie Rippleton. Right, right. Uh, Violet Brown hooked us up with Tina Marie. She came down, and while she's in there warming up, we're thinking, okay, we got the track done. You know, so I understand what you were saying. We were recording everything. Right. You know, we were like, okay, that's it, that's it, that's just so fucking dope. That's it. She was like, no, guys, no, guys, hold on. I'm going to make it a little bit better. No, no, I, that was it. That was it. <laughs> No, but we were in for a treat. And it, was, it was an it was an amazing time because, for us, we were supposed to be recording, but we were enjoying the concert. Oh man, I mean, I, when I was, I think it was eighty four, uh, when when um, you know the Portuguese love and the Irons and the Fire album, and then to be working with her, you know, a lot of that stuff, you know, I I couldn't believe it. You know, when right. I see people that I you know I didn't know nothing about music really. But to end up meeting um, um, Tina Marie, and then I remember one time I was at uh, Cherokee, and I'm on Fairfax, and we in there knocking it out and whatever, whatever. And then somebody came to me like, "Hey man, Rick want to meet you." I'm like, "Who the hell is Rick?" <laughs> and the come dude walking the door is goddamn Rick James. You be he like, said, "Oh, who the hell is Rick?" Right. That's the first thing I always fucking say. Who the fuck is Rick? 
You know, and he, hey, Rick want to meet you. You know, I'm like, who the fuck is Rick? And why are you telling me this? But he came in like, hey, how you doing, son? You know, I'm like, oh, shit, fucking Rick James, you know. And uh, there's a few people in my life that I'm at all when I see them. Like, the, you know, the... Uh, of course. Yeah, the, uh, what do I saw? Stanley Clark and uh, uh, Marcus Miller and people like that. I'm like, I'm like a kid when I see right, them right. kind of people. Wow. Okay, brother... <laughs> We're going to press pause one more time. Just like I took a set, homie. We'll be right back with Sir Jinx. Uh, let somebody know that I got Sir Jinx in the building. Still let somebody here. know that uh, we got some dope questions. We're going to be talking about uh, Dr. Dre, Ice Cube next. Uh, you ain't going to want to go nowhere. I'm Rick James, bitch. <laughs> Put the five fingers say to the five of the face. <laughs> What about now? Dr. Dre is in effect. Cold tan shit up with my man Steve at the Rodeo Swap Meet. And we here to lay it on the line. To all them sucker niggas out there claiming our tapes and shit, we just got one thing to say. Live a Ace and Padrino, and you tuned in to Rhodium Radio with my man Tony A. Keep it locked. What's up? This is Esther Dazza, Spanish Fly, Harbor Area's finest. Tune in to Tony A on Rhodium Radio. and all hip-hop fans this is your girl violet brown and i'm here with tony a the wizard and if you're rolling with us right now that means that you love west coast hip-hop and if you want to know the real deal from the real players the real people behind the scenes you better pick up tony's new film rhodium mixtape documixery you get it by going to documixery.com you better get this and I want to do a special shout out and a rest in peace to my man, Steve Yano. I'm out.
What up, this is DJ Trick, Spanish Fly, and you're watching Tony A on the Rhodium Radio Show. Yo, what up, this is Big Daddy Swoles on Rhodium Radio, and I'm holding down my man out here, my boy, Tony A. The Wizard, 1000, check this out. Big G, Rhodium Radio, Tony A in full effect. Stay tuned, watch, listen. This is how we doing it over here. Boy, Lonzo, the Godfather of the West Coast Hip Hop, and I'm kicking it live with my man Tony A. Check out his latest documentary on DocuMixery.com. It's the bomb. It's all about my man Steve Yano and his contribution that he created from the Rodium Swap that's still alive right here on, on, on Redondo Beach Boulevard. Check it out, y'all. DocuMixery.com. My man Tony A. Much love, y'all. Much love, Steve. Peace. About this young kid from the harbor area named Tony A, and he was a DJ, you know what I'm saying? He was going in with, with the big with the big stars, you know what I'm saying? And he was like one of us going in and infiltrating inside of all these MCs, you know what I'm saying? A rodeo mixtape is just mixed of different types of music, no matter what genre it is. Uh, and like I said, it's it's like a, like making your own musical movie. When La Raza came out, man, I just, even the amount of sales of the single of La Raza that got moved out of the rhodium was, it was crazy, bro. And that song just got played and was played in all the stands over there. And I was blessed to go back one time, even to see it. And I want to say in 91 or 92. Although they were not black, they were, or, you know, Asian, whatever you want to call them. They, they were cool and they embraced everybody, blacks, Latinos, whoever came to the came to the swap meet the wanna buy music they were record people Ice Cube getting dumb at the rodeo with the funky drum and you know my man Steve can get some With a fool like Tony A when he plays stupid dope shit by W.A. You wanna spray dumb motherfuckers no doubt and suck a DJ Get the fuck out Tony A What did you say on the What did you say on Tony A Action sound, give me that mic, double fucking go down. 
thinking of a master plan. <laughs> yeah. Yo, welcome back everybody to Rodian Radio. Having a dope Bro, ass yeah. time with uh Sir Jinx uh reminiscing uh when I met him when he was 17 years old and I'm 51 now and I don't know if he wants to tell you his age, but we are still reminiscing uh having I'm a dope still ass. 17 years still old. 17 years old. Hell yeah. <laughs> the music keeps you young. You know. Now No, not giving a fuck keeps me young. Exactly. Okay. Now now let me ask you this. Okay. Yeah. Because of course, these are for the fans. I already know, and I'm glad I know, but for the fans, you know, they all know that Dr. Dre is your cousin. Uh, let's take it a little step further. Did you ever end up doing any production with Dre that maybe we may not know about? Uh, no, not really. I was just pretty much a support squad back in the day. Uh-huh. Uh, they, you know, they had it pretty much sold up, you know. I was just taking the back seat. And, and I always say, when... Um, you know, when Q went solo and I went to New York with him, of course, I just, I didn't learn how to do music immediately. So I just jumped right in. So, you know, when Q left, I already had beats. So by the time I got there, you know, I think I was well trained. You know, we was already in the studio yes. with um, stuff. I was, you know, I call it hitting the bag. And uh, when we went out there, I, I was always just in the background soaking up game, you know. And I probably had an opinion here and there, but uh, Dre and Yella and Eric and, you know, all them guys, they, they had it they had it pretty much sold up. Okay. You, you know, now let me ask you this because me, when somebody tells me that, you know, like my son, Dad, what would you call like, maybe a certain time in your life that you said was part of some of the funnest times. To me, not only was it at the Rhodium with Steve hanging out, watching my mixtape sell, meeting you, meeting Dre, and, you know, uh, meeting Easy there, but also being at Audio Achievements. Right. I loved being there, man. Right. I loved it. Do you have any type of memories when you used to go and chill or, you know? Well, Audio Achievements, you know, we were there first with, uh you know, we was recording the CIA records, and uh, you know, Dre was always there with uh, Donovan, and uh, uh, it was just a growing period, man. I mean, Audio Achievements was like, you know, like the kindergarten going into high school. You know what I'm saying? It was like either you knew it or you didn't, and everybody got their shot. Everybody used to go up there. I remember me, I see Warren. And Warren would get dropped off up there, you know, and, uh, you know, I always had a ride because Dre had to come back home. So, right. but, uh, man, I seen people up there get stuck up there and it was just, man, it was just like a good, uh, recruiting place and everybody that came out of there sold some records. So it was well, kind of dope. One of the highlights of my musical career, I know this might sound goofy to some people. I don't care. Okay? <laughs> you shouldn't. I, I was an audio achievements and um i was doing a mixtape that we called recop and easy was on it and dre was on it and we were audio achievements and then uh steve goes uh, uh and he knew that he was like you know fulfilling like a dream of mine he goes why don't you roll with dre so we i had hopped in dre's red mercedes mm -hmm. I hopped, yeah mm -hmm. and uh, uh steve was riding with easy and we rode to my house here in wilmington and to me I feel like a five-year-old kid, like his dad taking him to the mall or right. something. Because when I pulled up, all my homies were across the street. Right. And they saw me get up with Dre, man. So mm -hmm. to me, that to me, that was like a highlight. And then to be able to walk, you know, through my living room when my mother's watching novellas, cooking Mexican food, and, you know, bring, bringing them in. And then, you know, e uh, easy flipping over a record crate, sitting there, writing his eight-bar, 16-bar verse. Mm -hmm. Dre was like, okay, where do I start? Oh, just right here. This is the part. Getting on the mic, rapping. You know, it to me, it was that was an amazing time. You know, again, because I looked up to him from the world class wrecking crew. Right. You know, but um, now back to what you said. You had went to New York, started working on the Cube album. Um, how how was that like, man? You know, it was just a fun experience. I mean, you know, going out to New York, you know. 
And it happened so fast because we was on the road at first, and that was the first time I ever uh, was on a plane and ever got out of L.A. or anything. So it's a certain smell. I, I, I don't know if you know, it's, it's a certain smell that when you're getting ready to go on tour and then you smell the buses. Okay. Like, that that's when I always feel like it's real. When you start smelling the, the buses there, sitting there island. <laughs> and that when I was in New York, that just like you know, you just remember little things that, that trigger your mind. Like whenever I'm in front of a hotel and I see a bus drive up and I smell the smoke, I was immediately thinking of being on tour, waking up five in the morning, you know, right. getting on the bus and stuff. But dealing with New York um, I kind of felt that because it was cold all the, all the time, you know, and then we were right. always being commuted with, you know, people taking the pollutions and stuff like that. So to experience New York, it was like, it was just so dope, man, because, you know, I'm a hip hop guy for real. And if you hip hop for real, then you looked up to New York guys, you know, the break dance and the graffiti, the stuff like that. So when I went there, it was just a little bit more for me to be there because I did all the elements. You know, I did the break dance and I did the rap and I did the graffiti. I did the DJ. So for me to go there, it was just, man, it smells different. You know, right, so like right. I said, when I smell the tour buses. Or when I go to New York, it's a certain smell that, I don't know, smell like success. I don't know if you can ever smell that. That's dope, man. That's it smells dope. like, and anytime I go there, I know I'll be like, oh, I cannot. <laughs> I need some hoes in this motherfucker. Right. I need a new gang. I need something. I smell money in this motherfucker. And I'm brand new. Every time you go to New York, you smell that city bustle and that, like I said, that tour bus world and uh Working yeah. on America's Most Wanted, that uh, it was there, in the it was in the winter too. I was there twice uh, uh, earlier this year in New York. I, I love going over there. Big shout out to my boy uh, DJ Toro. He hosts a show called This Is Fifty uh, for Fifty Cent. He lives in Harlem, and I go and I stay with him. Right, right. So right. I, I love waking up in Harlem and staying. You just in feel like you need to be doing something, right? Yes, like you yes. Go to the deli, you get your sandwich, you get your routine going. Your hustle and bustle starting at seven fifteen. Yes, you cannot sleep late in the you would just be for no reason. Yeah. Your back start hurting something. I don't know. The <laughs> beds won't let you sleep that motherfucker. Oh, they stand up like nigga. Don't you, shouldn't you be going somewhere? <laughs> right, right. But I love the hustle and bustle in New York. It make you get up in the morning. Now, uh, off of that first album, uh, do you have uh, possibly a favorite song off of that? Uh, Once upon a time in the projects. Probably. Once upon a time in the project. I remember right. when I first heard those fucking lyrics, they were fucking insane because Q painted you a mental picture. Right. You know, and that was that, that was dope. Because sometimes you know, today you can hear a beat, you can bob your head, but when you can hear the story and then see it all play out, right? That's amazing. Well, uh, you know, it, it, I, I like Once Upon a Time Time in the Project because it, it served uh, two purposes, and and people don't know. One thing is I made the slowest track to where Public Enemy was making the fastest track. So for them to be that kind of producer and I can get a slow song placed, it meant more to me to have a slow song placed right. when they wasn't doing slow songs. The whole album could have been right off the top and I'm rolling. And I knew they couldn't beat me on that floor. Right. Right. Or just hate on me to say the track don't fit. But then my song was over here and then, you know, Endangered Species. And then I did the bomb. So the bomb was me keeping up with them. That was me playing their game. But then they start playing my game when I did Once Upon a Time in the Project. Then they did Gangsta's Fairy Tale. So it was almost like we were meeting yeah. in the middle to I do the slow, y'all do the fast. I do a couple fast, y'all do a couple slow. But I bought the couple slow. I bought that. <laughs> and I thought uh, the cut with uh, uh, once, once Upon a Time in the Projects, um, in the, you know, the Betty, Betty Davis uh, sample. Wow. And um, that song was actually for um, a group I had called Rhythm. And Rhythm was a group that was out of Oakland that I used to, I was trying to get signed to Ruthless back in the day. And um, Rhythm ended up turn, changing their name to Souls of Mischief. So the Once Upon a Time in the Projects beat has a life to it 
without America's Most Wanted. Like it has its own little yeah. story that came about the sample and how I got the sample and how I was using it and how Tajay and Adam was rapping on it. And then I ended up taking it and then giving it to Cube. So that that beat, when you say my favorite beat, that, that beat had, uh, it traveled. It came dope, from Los dope. Angeles to New York to get, to, to be on the record. Dope, dope. I, I remember when we, me and High C were filming our video at Venice Beach for a goofy song that we have called Leave My Curls Alone. Yeah. And Easy showed up. All right. And it was funny because he had the death certificate album right. on cassettes. Uh -huh. And I remember Quick was there, Second the Nun was there, AMG was there. So we bumped it. And we're, right. you know, and and I, I know you would have worked on it. Uh, uh, if, if I may ask you, uh, what is one of your favorite tracks on that death certificate album? I don't know, probably no Vaseline, probably at this point. <laughs> I knew that, but I had to ask you. Well, I, I mean, I think Us, it was a lot of songs on there that predicted the riots and stuff like that, like Black Korea. Those songs wasn't hood songs, but they was historic songs because they made an imprint on when the riots had happened. So it was like we predicted the riots in that song. So I like that song because it was political. I, I, I used to didn't like to do political songs with Hugh. I, I, I always wanted to be in the hood, like, you know what I'm saying? But he was like, your music make me talk like that. Yo, when I hear your beat, it made me go that way. So I always wanted kicking in the back rope. Dum, 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 dum. He would never do that. So most of the songs me and him worked on, they were target songs that we wanted to have on the record, hit or no hit. He wanted to get this off his chest. And other people, well, I wouldn't say other people, but the other producers that were there always wanted to be in the club or always wanted to be in the car. I wanted to pe I wanted people just to groove to my beats. I don't care if you danced or not. So the songs that I did, I care less if they danced or not. Okay. I just made them to to cuz I know a bunch of my homies, they don't they didn't dance. So right. why should I keep making music to the homies and they don't even dance? They just nod their head. They just nod their so head. when I did Dead Homies, that song Dead Homies, uh Man, I saw, you know, real niggas cry off of that song. A real rap song made niggas cry. That was a dope I, video, by the way, right, too. Right, but they just knew. And, and, and when, when, when the homies was listening to it, it wasn't no, it was quiet. <laughs> like, boy, you can hear the tape, you're turning in that. Right, you know right. What I'm saying? Doom, doom, boom, 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 boom. You see it, you know, and you try to play it off with Yeah. <laughs> I try to play it off, and they was really boohooing off of that song. So I just stayed in my place, and uh, you know, just did the tempos that I thought would be dope. Now this may sound like a goofy question. But, There's no uh, such thing as a goofy question. Okay, uh, let me try you then. That's uh -huh. a goofy question. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, my brother. Um, when, how long do you think, or do you know, that it took Q to write No Vaseline? Was it almost know. automatic? Nah, it was about three, four years. Three or four years? Right. Wow. Right. It, it was uh, two or three years. He had it. Okay. So he wrote it for years. He didn't. He wasn't going. We wasn't going to release it. We we. It it didn't. It wasn't even a song. It was just a rap he had. Like he always had the first rap. So anybody come over, I like Cube, say that rap again. Say that rap again. You know, goddamn, I'm glad y'all said it off. It used to be hard, but da, da, da. so if you listen to the song, the timeline of having a dinner with the president and all that stuff was a far away timeline. You know, from the Michelle A to the thing. So every couple of you know months, he add another verse. Oh, I get it. So it, it that that's probably the longest timeline diss song on what it's worth. You know what I'm saying? On covering so much ground. He covered a lot of ground to where a lot of so called diss songs are for one period. Mm -hmm. They're like, Oh, you did this, you was at the club, you was wearing this. It's not like, oh, and then when you graduated, you was a bum then, you know, it's like it was a long spectrum of time that um it it, it took him to write that song. Wow, you know, cause, cause let me say this. Okay, first of all, I'm gonna say it. Okay, uh, and I believe the whole West Coast will agree. I know sometimes you look at these blogs or you look at people on social media or even the Source magazine back in the day, which is the all-time greatest diss song ever. They would mention Nas, they would mention Jay Z, and okay, first of all, if you ask me, it's always gonna be No Vaseline. 
No Vaseline, the greatest diss song ever. Well, period. you understand the story. A lot of there's a lot of diss records that I like, but if you don't understand the story, then it lessens the impact of how important it is. You know, so right. I, I like. I'd say the realest raps in the game are diss raps. Like when people make raps about themselves, ah, I don't get it. But this other dude saying you're a buster. That might be real. <laughs> <laughs> he might be. That might be the realest shit I've heard. Yeah, you know, that's true. you dope as hell on your own verses. But when this other dude talking about you, yeah, this record, this rap has to be the realest rap. Well, because ain't nobody just lie on you to to diss you. Usually they saying stuff that has merit to it. You know, yes, so most yes. rappers make songs and be like hey, you wasn't on 105th like you know you wasn't there you know and yes i was you know but the disc records if they say you wasn't there it might be true to wow. them you know wow that's dope man that's dope. <laughs> you know what because those lyrics his style went perfect with that beat and i don't give a shit what anybody says i still play that song today like if it's a new song especially the way you started right this is what to think about you this is what the thing all that shit was fucking dope, right. bro. because that, that that was fucking with him you know so that 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 was the part that was really fucking with cube and that's why we did it like that here's what they think about you here's what they think about you because he didn't want to he didn't want to go against him so that's why we put ah ice cube ain't shit without a wa ah, and you know you know he they, and they, oh that was talking about them well there was nothing when they came to the, in europe because it was a thing where um, I think N.W.A. went out, went out the country and kind of didn't do very well out there. And uh, we got wind of that, but we never wanted to make a diss record. It right. was just, they kept saying Bitch O'Shea and, and Benedict Arnold and all that stuff. That came later wow. and he didn't want it. He never wanted to uh, um, respond to it until right. it started being like, oh, you scary or you scared to go against them. And it was more of a family type friendly fight, you know, kind of like slap boxing a little. It wasn't, <clears throat> I don't take it like how the disc records are today. It was just uh, creatively healthy, you know, for hip hop, for people to have those kind of rhymes and not kill each other. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. They have more love than hate for each other. That's why the song is still going good today is because it was just an opinion and it wasn't drawn out. Cube didn't throw nobody under the bus. He didn't talk about their personal life. You know, he was just pretty much sticking to the topic, I think. So that, that made the diss song, um, when you start um, looking at how to rate a diss song, you know, and did, did he make his point? You know, did, was it some punchlines in it? Is it funny? Is it real? Is the beat hard? Because usually beat diss records, people don't put too much energy into the production. So the whole all around song, I, I you know, I, I think uh, I heard it on the radio. It, it, that, 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 that threw me off. I yeah. never thought I'd hear that song on the radio. Yeah. yeah. Now let me ask you the, next, <laughs> the, the last question yeah. pertaining to that song. The last question, and then we'll move on. Um, you being the producer and being Dre's cousin and him this in NWA, did you receive any backlash from those guys at all? Nah. They, they thought it was funny. Okay. Nobody took it serious. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the, like. <laughs> Nobody took it serious. I mean, they knew what Cube was doing. I mean, they was doing it to each other, you know. So if somebody wanted to, you know, get on, get on wax and, and say who Cube is, they didn't know. I don't know if they had anybody to do that because Cube was the one writing the diss songs. Right. So right. I don't know if DOC could have wrote something for them, but... You know, on G thing, there is a shot at Cube. On I G saw thing. that. I heard that. Right, but when you listen to it now, it's not really there no more. Hmm. So it's like mobbing a like mobbing like a motherfucker. But I ain't lynching. That was a, definitely a shot at Cube. But now it's a mobbing like a motherfucker. Bow wow wow. What about the part when it says on a street knowledge mission? Remember that part? Right. You know, so. But, I mean, it was a whole bunch of inside stuff that didn't take off. Nobody didn't bite it. Just like when we did Jackin' for Beats, Jackin' for Beats was supposed to be a diss towards N.W.A. Because the first song was uh, Niggas for Life, right? And that's that doom, 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 doom. That was that kind of thing. And then when we went to get the, the songs cleared, Dre and them had already, that was an original track. So they denied, denied us usage of... Right. Uh, niggas for life beat so we use D nice beat 
So the first song, give me that doom, 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 doom. That beat fool is a full time jack move. If it was under, under, if he rapped over niggas for life, they would have got it. That's why at the end of Jack of a Beats, is hey, stop, 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 surprise niggas, but nobody even got it. Wow. It, it never, it never went to them. It just Cube just made the first mixtape song ever. The first mixtape song, right, bro. Right. That's we got more credit for that, but then. Uh, they was like, oh, you still, you know, tiptoeing around. That's why when we did the, uh, the death certificate, we were like, oh, it ain't no motherfuckers. Because right. everybody listened to the whole album to see if he threw anything at them. We do nothing. We didn't do nothing. But when, as soon as uh, it started up, you know, here's what they think about you. A bitch is a bitch. I don't know. I think that's a man's word. But you know how I go with the intro right. and the long intro. Bitch, bitch. No, that's a... It's a man's world. But uh, when No Vaseline came on, it was just what everybody wanted. They wanted that song. They oh. wanted it. Oh. And it turned up. And it was banging. And it was up-tempo. Yeah. They, uh, it shit, all worked. That shit was still rock a club tonight, man. Right, right. I don't give a right, shit with anybody, right. so that shit was still rock a club. Like how the ether, like how ether and um, Jay-Z and... Well, as soon as you hear that ether come on, it's just... I don't know. It just do something to you. Like, okay, well, I'm gonna say it. Cool. I like those songs, but I like your your song better. <laughs> but Period. I like this records. I, like I said, I think they're the realest songs because you can find out about somebody through somebody that don't like you. That's that's amazing. <laughs> like, let me find out about Tony A. Let me see who don't like him. Let's see, yeah. You're in a low low. You don't got no low low. Oh, he don't. Like you know, what I'm saying that this records is dope. They tell you the truth. That should be a motherfucker's bio. <laughs> right, right. You're right. Let right. your enemy write your bio. Ah, oh, this is gonna be crazy. <laughs> that's just dope. Well, well, you know, I mean, I hope nobody out there thinks I'm a fucking asshole. But I, I usually shoot from the gut and I tell people I'm a really like a I'm a I'm a real teddy bear, bro. Yeah. It's just that I'm a guy that likes to shoot it from the gut, and some people don't like straight shooters. Oh yeah. You know, some people don't like. Well, I don't like you tell me straight. I just pat me in the back and tell me everything's gonna be okay. I'm not that type of guy. Right. I never have been. I think most people took took that situation with Eric. And and um and Dre more personal than than it really was. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, how can you love somebody and put them in the game and then turn around and hate them for something that was true? So what Cube was saying was true. What was happening to his crew? Right. So how can you be mad at Cube when y'all all left for the same reason? Yeah. So. I don't think it was like, you know, it wasn't like hate. They didn't hate each other. They, we was around each other. The, the, where we worked at and, and how we did production, that was all in the same area. I mean, at right. some point, if they had that much beef, everybody could be found. I mean, everybody just kind of went their separate ways. And, you know, even Eric. Eric could have, you know, went on and disc cube and made songs about them and but he they didn't do it i think they liked each other too much did, did, did you like that song uh compton city g's yes i like that song too. shout out to rhythm d i i i really really like that song bro i thought that shit was fucking dope uh um that's my guy rhythm d he did the beat yeah right yeah i i remember curtis Harmon. Curtis Harmon, big shout out to Curtis Harmon. Flew down from Japan, brought some Japanese guys to my apartment and down the beach and he, they, they bought some beats off of me. Right. And he was like, you gotta watch out for Rhythm D. Rhythm D. So much love and respect to Rhythm D. Shout out to Rhythm D, yeah. yeah that, that, That's that, my that, guy. That shit was dope, man. So now, uh, have a quick question about Steve Yano and the Swamp Meat before we get into what are you doing now? Um, we did this and you were a part of it. You know, and I'm so glad because you were the missing piece, the Rody Mixtape documentary. Yes. You were a part of it. Now, my question to you is, do you believe that it was important to be to document Steve's legacy, Steve's history? I mean, you have a passion and uh, people appreciate your passion and to keep his, his name alive is something that we all need to do when it comes to the guys that made that paved the way that didn't have no jersey 
You know, I kind of look at it like that. Like, he made the sport but didn't get a jersey. Like, nobody don't know, don't know what's right. going on. And as we carry the ball and we keep going forward, we got to make sure they realize it wasn't as easy as, as people thought. There's people that's behind the scenes, like you said, the Violet Browns, the Calvin Andersons, you know what I'm saying, the yes. different people that we got to keep out there because there's other people that are in the music industry that can play the same role. Like they can, they don't have to be the rapper. They can be the helper. And Steve was definitely a helper and people just don't know unless they go further, further, further down and they find out that he's also inspiring for rappers to keep going, but also business people that they know they're going to keep his name alive. You know, and I, Steve was 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 cool with me. He had the deep voice, you know. And he never wanted to get on the tapes. He never <laughs> wanted to do that. But uh, he had them Wendy's and uh, <laughs> that, that Wendy's, that Wendy's double cheese, boy. No, no. Um, I can go with some Wendy's, some some chili with some fries. That's what, when I stop at Wendy's, I'll buy a little thing of chili, and I'll dump all my fries in there. But I, I call I, I call because I, I used to call myself Rat Boy. Cause I didn't have no money. Rap boy. Right, 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 right. right. That's what I call my son. That's my son's nickname, Rap Boy. Big shout out to Rap Boy Brian B. Scandals. I was Rap Boy like a motherfucker. I didn't have no goddamn money. I see uh, Steve pull up, boy. Talk about dumb cheese, dumb bacon. He just get what you want. Oh. Well, you see that roll? Let me get that roll, boy. I'll be in there eating. You know, I've had the isms, boy. But uh, yeah, Steve definitely. That was just a period of time, man. That was just dope. That you can't, you can't change it. You right. know, you can't take. You can't. You, Dre can, can can be Dr. Dre. Jinx can be Jinx. Ice Cube be Ice Cube. Easy can be Easy. But at the end of the day, we all came together, and it wasn't for money. It wasn't for recognition. It was just an idea. Yes. That end up going. People didn't know of Mix Master's Pay recipes. He was the one that was doing the street tapes. Yes. So with the street tapes, then it came to rhodium. So when you were saying the situation with 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 Calvin, I took uh, Steve's process to uh, Long Beach. So when Ke when Steve used to have the the music plan. I, you know, by the bathroom, whatever, you know where it was at. If you always buy the uh, rhodium, y'all know where Steve was located. And he have a speaker. I took that process. Y'all can go look at it. Calvin Anderson, he'll say, Jinx came and say, hey, why don't we put a speaker out in the front? But I got that from Calvin. I mean, I got that from Steve. Yes. So when I was dealing with Calvin, he was dealing with more R&B and gospel. So that I, when I got there, I was like, man, you need to start buying some more rap. And so then he put the, the speaker out in front and VIP was born. Because VIP is right next to Polly. Yes. So when the kids came out, if you look at the Snoop Dogg video with him on top of the thing, yes. they're repeating that day that Calvin will put the speaker out and yes. play music. The whole parking lot full of kids. Wow. <laughs> okay, let me show you a quick story. Me and my boy John, we go, uh, my boy DG was there. We go film Calvin for uh, the documentary, okay? All right. And um, he was already out of the original location, right, right, okay? Right. He was like literally walking distance around the corner. And he told me that VIP was now sold. Uh, it's gonna become a 7-Eleven. Right, it okay? is now, right now. No, but this was just bare, it, 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 right. it wasn't 7-Eleven yet. So we went over there and uh, I asked the guys, hey man, do you think I can get on top of the roof? And they were like, oh no, 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 you can't, you know. Some Mexican guy didn't speak too much uh, right. uh, English. So I spoke to them in Spanish. So I just said, please, you know, I just need to get up there, please. I need to film. I'm doing a documentary, a doc documentary, and it, it, uh, all they knew was, oh yeah, Snoop Dogg, Snoop, Snoop right, Dogg, right, right. you know. And I was like, yes, I need to get up there where Snoop Dogg was. Right, right. So they said, okay, hurry up, you know. Right, right, right. They put the ladder. They fucking held the ladder, bro, and they led me up there. Right. So in this documentary, I actually have probably the last footage of the VIP the sign, sign right. still up there, bro, and I'm up there. You know, uh, uh, being a part of history. Man, bro. I slept in that building, man. No I, shit? Hell yeah, man. I lived in L.A. And, you know, uh, somebody drop you off at that motherfucker. It's <laughs> very hard to get back to L.A., Jack. So he had owned the whole part. So he used to rent out equipment, too. So if you look at the King T bass video with all the speakers all in the it. All the speakers. Those speakers are probably Calvin speakers. And the L.A. LA sound control shot it down. 
But uh, yeah, and we set up a little bitty studio there, and uh, I was sleeping there, man. Wow. Right. Wow. And didn't have a ride home. <laughs> I didn't give a fuck. Right, of course. We love we love music, and right, that's what we did. Right, I was sleeping next to my drum machine. Yes, I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Like back in the when you, I loved back in the day when we were just um, naive. Like I, I love my naive Sir Jinx. I, I like that person. Yeah, I'll tell you the days that I love when I have to get up in the morning and my drawers and my butt huggers. They didn't even wash my grill yet. Turn on the fucking drum machine, the SP12. Burnt. Get the fucking floppy. Let that motherfucker load up. That's a beautiful sound, bro. Right, right. It's a beautiful sound. So now, let me ask you this. Now, what is Jinx working on to, today? I know one of the projects is working with Mellow. Mm -hmm. Speak on that a little bit. Well, well me and Mellow, we, we just working it out, uh, doing some new music, testing some new sounds, uh, uh, just trying to give our kind of people what they want. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm, I'm working with a few people. I'm just stirring the pot when it comes to wanting music that we want to hear. You know what I'm saying? It's a difference. We we, we turn it into the cool in the gangs of our time, okay. which are where the new kids is a little bit over with. Uh, we, you know what I'm saying? We might be, you know, LTD or whatever. You know, <laughs> we, 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 I, I want to continue that process, you know? And so with me and Melo, we just going to, you know, make, just make some good music, you know what I'm saying? Cool, and I got a um I got a record out there. Um y'all check it out. It's called Hood War Order. And that's a song an album I did like with Corrupt and and Noble and Eastwood and um Roscoe and a whole bunch of people. It's like a compilation record that I got. And I got another one, um, Hood War Order. And I, that's what you know, I did King T of course, again, Corrupt, MC8, uh, uh, Drayster. We talked yeah. about uh, uh, the easy -E situation, Drayster. And it's the first song that Drayster and Corrupt has ever been on. So you remember the situation yeah. with, with that. So that was just a beautiful thing to have them on the record, on the West Wing record. And then I got my, um, my um, instrumental records. Uh, I got one called West Wing. Not West Wing is the album, but I got one called Hood. Uh, um, um, Beats for Food, and it's my instrumental series. So I got the instrumental series, Beats for Food, The City Never Sleeps, Next Man's Treasure, and Jinx Instrumentals. So those like albums that I've been putting out, and I just been you know on the independent scene, and uh, you know y'all check them beats out. They they're real good. I think where, so. Where can, if somebody's watching right now and saying, okay, I want to listen to those Jinx Instrumentals, man. Right. Uh, 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 those are instrumentals that you call Jinx Instrumentals. Right. Where can somebody listen to those? Uh, you can go on YouTube. I, I mean, you know, I, I'm not really pressed on selling them like that. So that's why I made them super available for free. So they can go, you know, you can go on Spotify or, you know, okay. Tidal or whatever. Okay. But the, you can go on YouTube and just type in Sir Jinx. Or you can go to SoundCloud, type in Sir Jinx. I got also mixes that I've done. So I got about four or five mixes. They're like 20 minute mixes, like old school track track mixes on uh, SoundCloud. They go to SoundCloud, they can go to uh, 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 you know iTunes or whatever if they want to purchase some. Cause I know a lot of cats hit me up and they be like, Jinx, you know, can I use that beat? And I be like, yeah, they was like, send it to me. I'm like, it's 99 cent. <laughs> Like what the fuck? <laughs> what? Go get it. Go it's get ninety nine it. cent. It's gonna cost me more to even talk to you right now. So people be like, all right, like you better than ninety nine cent work. Damn. So nah, but uh, some people get them and put them on mixes. I remember this one guy uh, got and took my beat and added J Cole to it, and another person took my beat and uh, added Tupac to it, like acapellas, and they try to make new versions of right, it. Right, right, so right. it's a new life for my production. I try to instill in new producers that your beat is not dead when it's over. <laughs> It can have a new parent, right, so right, I go right. back in mine, and I own all my beats. So I just like to give people a new start, like for people that's writing, especially you know how the pen is right now, and and dealing with cats in jail and stuff, and they need instrumentals too. So you yeah. know, so I just try to make a whole bunch of instrumentals for people that can't afford my um, production, but they can write to it, they can do whatever they want to it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, when they say you don't give back, I'll be like, you're goddamn lie. I got them beats up there for ninety nine cents. 
for 99 cents. And <laughs> Say, I don't give back. I, I mean, know. that's like jack-in-the-box prices. You know what I'm right, saying? You can right, get right, two right, tacos right, for 99 right. cents. So. If they do their business right, it's easy. I learned that from uh, one of my guys. Shout out uh, Trevor Lawrence that, uh, you know, was with the Aftermath. And then I'm focusing those guys. And and it ain't all about the prices. It ain't all about selling my beats. It's about getting the beats to the people that can make my beat fly and make it make it be dope again. Dope. You know, so I can take beats back. Dope. If they didn't work, all y'all producers out there, remember, if that beat didn't work, you still can work it. So I, that's why I made my instrumental records. So there's a lot of beats on there. You know, and one of them is the, uh, the track that me and Dr. Dre did together. And that was the T.I. song when I did with T.I. T.I. is called Dope with a Marsha Ambrosia and uh, I'm with a Leah. It's a Leah sample, but, you know, I, I just do crazy beats. So I still got that beat going. I got the beat going and I also got my album going. And then I'm working with Rodney O and I'm working with Melo. I got a couple guys, my homeboy Boss Hog, he out in, um, in San Diego. He doing his thing. And my, my other homie, he's dope. He's a young guy I've been fucking with for a long time. His name was Mark Ford, and he's he's a dope rapper, upcoming rapper. I, I think that uh, cat should check him out. He shoot his own videos, do his own thing. Mark Ford. Uh, yeah, Mark dope, Ford. dope. Thank you, James, man. Let me tell you something. The one I'm looking forward to is the one with you and Melo Man Ace. Yeah. To me, uh, uh, in my opinion, you guys are two legends coming together, and I cannot expect nothing but fucking success out of uh, We gonna have some crew crews and music. That's what me and him because we know we do our little focus groups. We, you know. Before I work on a, a track, we, we try to figure out where we're going with it yes, first. Yes. You know what I'm saying? We ain't going to just be shooting in the dark, just making demos. So, you know, that's the one thing. we I wanted some nice music to where people would be like, I that made me feel different. Yes. Like when people hear the yes. music, like it made me feel different. Like it wasn't like, us, you know, like, let's put anything together and sell it. No, I think we're going to put a little time in it and, 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 and make it conceptual to like I was telling Melo sitting over here right now. Uh, we was like, well, it's, it's like taking me around Cuba, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. or, or just driving through his world through my eyes, you know what I'm saying? Through my production or the, yes. through my direction. And uh, I think I think it'll be dope. It's something I've been wanting to work on for a long time. Dope, dope. Okay. Without further ado, let me go ahead and announce Here come this. the stereo crew. Yes, ah, sir. Ah, run it, man. Run it, man. The Rodian Mixtape Dr. Mix Ray is now available. It's actually tomorrow. It'll be one month that it's been out. Oh, if cheers. If you have not seen it, you have to see You will not be disappointed. Okay. I'll say go to DrMixRay.com. And you can purchase it for unlimited streaming. You can stream it to your TV. It actually tells you right there when you can purchase it, how to watch it on your TV, okay? People always uh, DM me, people always message me, how can I watch it on my TV? It's actually there. Uh, it tells you how to uh, watch it on your TV. So once again, it was directed by me and it's a John Elkins film. Um, other than that, uh, let me go ahead and give credit where credit is due. Uh, I like to give thanks to John motherfucking Elkins because without him, none of this would be made possible. He made this podcast possible. He made this this flyers possible, this shirt possible, uh, this just everything that he has done. Uh, um, I, I would not be here if it wasn't for a man like him. Okay, I like I always like to give credit where credit is due. I would also like to thank uh, my boy DG Media Clips for filming a lot of the documentary. Another person that is very important to this team, uh, a guy named Roger uh, Mera, Roger Live. Uh, another guy named Kerry Fujita, uh, South Bay Drones, he was our drone guy. Boomer, Boomer did it, Remedy Yard, thank you for him. Wiz One, all of these guys are my team. Uh, if I'm forgetting somebody, please forgive me. Uh, I'll mention you next week. Um, other than that, my boy Melo Manes, much love and much success Mello. to him. Um, Sandy Pants at Sandy's Insights. Uh, look her up on YouTube, Sandy's Insights. She has her own podcast on uh, Sundays. And I, I believe in supporting those that support me. You know, um, other than that, if I'm forgetting anybody, once again, please forgive me. My son, B. Scanlon, for helping me push this. And I would like to thank uh, my boy, Jinx, once again. Uh, you know, I don't call too many people friends. You know, um, I can count all my friends in one hand and have fingers left over, okay? And I can say that Jinx right here is my good friend. Oh, thank you, And brother. I want to say thank you once again for coming. 
and uh, being a part of Rodent Radio. Well, you uh, know what? At the end of the day, they can get at me on um, Sir Jinx, uh, DJ Sir Jinx on Instagram. I be having a little funny stuff, and you know, yeah. but we can just do the Instagram, and y'all can catch all my music, like I said, on iTunes or YouTube. I prefer you go to YouTube because you can listen to it for free. I'm not really caring about, you know, how it, how it gets sold or whatever because it, it do its numbers yeah. regardless. So uh, if y'all can just check out my music and uh, leave a comment, man, exactly. tell me tell me if you like it or not. Exactly. Yeah. So once again. Go ahead and download, order uh, unlimited streaming, the Rodin Mixing Doctor Mixery. Please support the movement. Thank you. You have a blessed night. I will post. Get into what's going in here. Come here I will yeah. post next week's, here, next me. Wednesday's we uh, um, on, artist tomorrow. Tomorrow yeah. morning, next Wednesday's artist tomorrow, and then Sunday's artist. We're back on on Sundays once again, starting at seven o'clock. I will uh, promote him on Friday. So, once again, uh, Johnny Boy, go ahead and show Mellow Man Ace right here. My boy Mellow Man Ace is here. Got to show Mellow him some Man love. Mellow Ace in the building. Him and Mel oh, uh, what uh, camera are we on? Sir Jinx, we you got to check the middle one right here. Hey, hey, I'm here with my peoples, my boys, man. It's always a blessing, brother. You know what it is. You know hey. what it is. Introduce your homie. <clears throat> oh, man, I brought my OG right here, Daryl Pueblo Bishop Bloods right here. That's the OG, been with me since 1984, 85. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We all, y'all have a blessed night. Thank you. Ah, that's a good one. My God.